As Andre said, I'll be looking at uh, cortical neuroplasticity and exploring the clinical implications for children with hearing loss. So our lab has been looking mainly at developmental neuroplasticity in children, and the biomarkers that we are using are cortical auditory evoked potentials. So the most um, useful biomarker is this P1, which comes from the area of the auditory cortex. We've looked at it using high-density EEG and fMRI, and we know it has input from the primary auditory cortex, so we have a good biomarker of looking at function and development of the cortex. I'd like to show you how we do it clinically in children. I know many of you are pediatric audiologists, and you know that unless it is easy to do, it's not going to work with children. So this, this is how we do it. We have the child sitting there on the parent's lap. We never use anesthesia or anything like that. It's always natural state. We present speech sounds through a speaker, and then without any sound, we have the child distracted and happy using um, some cartoons or whatever they like. We use this ba sound for speech, and you can see we use a few electrodes and the children are usually quite happy, <laughs> as long as you have the right video. And then on the other side of the booth, this is the ongoing EEG from the cortex. And about 10 minutes later, you see this very big response. It's hard to miss. It's, uh, it's five times the size of an ABR. And we always replicate it. You can see there's a, a red response here and then the green one. And so it's a very replicable response that you can get within half an hour of testing. And so this is what it, look like. it looks like. And what we found is the latency of this response, the time at which it occurs, is a very useful a marker of development of the cortex. So here you have latency on the y-axis and age on the x-axis, and in large groups of children, when we've looked at it, we found a very nice developmental trajectory. So it decreases quite rapidly until the second year of life, and then more gradually into the second and third decade. But what's important here is that it decreases, the latency decreases with age, so it tells you about the maturation at the auditory cortex. And these two lines represent the 95% confidence intervals for normal development. So since we understand normal development using this response, we can then ask the question, what happens in sensory deprivation? And Andre Kral has done some beautiful work in cats, which inspired our work in humans. This is an old slide, but I'd like to show it anyway. Here are the normal 95% confidence limits for normal development. When we look at children who get an implant very late in life, over seven years, you can see they are all abnormal. They all showed a typical development. Children who get an implant between three and a half and seven, half are within normal limits. So then the question is, is there a period of time when you can overcome the detrimental effects of development by getting a cochlear implant? And the answer is, if you get... Um, an implant within three and a half years of life, then you have essentially normal development in the auditory cortex. When we look at functional outcomes, this is a study from NYU, and this is speech perception on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. Here is normal development, normal children, uh, typical children, and what they found is children implanted under three is the dotted line, children implanted under two is the dashed line, and children implanted at under one year of age is, is this line. Initially, they found some differences where children implanted very early were closest to normal, but those differences went away when they looked at it as a function of experience with the implant. So here you can see essentially all children implanted under three, once they have enough experience, look very similar. So both the neurophysiology 
and the behavior suggests that there is a sensitive period of three and a half years during which implantation takes place into a highly plastic system. And of course, within this sensitive period, if you implant as early as possible by age one year, then you have the best outcomes. And the exciting news is, at least in vision now, they have tried to reopen sensitive periods, and maybe in a few years we'll try that in the hearing system as well. Okay, so that's about children with just sensory neural hearing loss. But I'm, oh, oh, sorry. I'm sure as audiologists, we also have experienced children with auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder because this is quite a prevalent disorder now. 10 to 15%, even 20% of children with sensory neural hearing loss could have auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, including up to 40% of NICU graduates. So I'd like to show you some data on neuroplasticity in children with ANSD. ANSD is a disorder, as all of you know, where it's actually neurological, where there is a problem in the synchrony of firing of neurons in the auditory nerve and the brainstem. And this is the primary problem. So we looked at children fit with ANSD who were fitted with hearing aids, and what we found is they fell into three distinct groups. Children with normal development, normal P1s, children with delayed development, and children who had completely abnormal cortical responses. We could not find any response at all. And what we found is that this is a very good clinical way to think about the severity of the disorder. So children with normal P1s, they reflect a mild level of dyssynchrony. Children with delayed P1s, a more moderate level of dyssynchrony. And children who are completely abnormal P1s or P cortical responses or EEG, they have a very severe level of dyssynchrony. And we have found that this is a better way of thinking about it for intervention than looking at just the audiogram in children with ANSD. So here we found one third of children in benefited with hearing aids because they showed normal cortical development. We've also looked at it using um, cortical phase synchrony, which is uh, a measure of phase locking at the cortex. And as you can imagine, this intertrial coherence, again, which is a measure of phase locking, so in children here, the, the more red the response, the more phase locking at the cortex. So the more, the higher level of synchrony. And again, children with normal P1s have a higher level of synchrony. Children with delayed P1s have a little bit lower and abnormal show no level of synchrony at all. So this is an interesting, and we've published this new way of thinking about the problem of ANSD and using cortical synchrony as a measure of um, understanding what's happening uh, in terms of their development. You might ask, what is the relationship to functional outcomes? And the relationship is quite good. Children who show high levels of cortical synchrony have the best cortical development and they have the best outcomes on speech perception and auditory skill development. Children who show very poor synchrony have the worst outcomes on auditory skill development. Okay, that was children with ANST who had hearing aids. What about children who have cochlear implants? So remember I showed you three groups, normal, delayed, and abnormal. Now when children with ANSD get a cochlear implant, look at this, we only see two groups. So there were no children with severe dyssynchrony deficits after cochlear implantation, which means every child with ANSD benefited with a cochlear implant. Not, they didn't get normal, but every single child benefited because there were no children with abnormal development. And so it, cochlear implantation provides some degree of benefit to most children. Of course, there's always a catch, which is, is there a sensitive period for children with, cochlear, uh, with uh, ANSD who get cochlear implants? Well, let's look at the data here again. Our children, uh, are the 95% confidence limits for normal development. When we look at children with ANSD who received an implant under two years of age, you can see the majority of them were within normal limits. But when we look at children who received an implant 
after two years of age, the majority of them were outside of normal limits. So it looks like that there is a sensitive period and it's earlier. It's about two years for children with ANSD, which means you should implant early. And clinically, what happens is quite the opposite. I don't know about in Germany, but in the States, these children are very difficult to manage. And so the implantation actually becomes much later. So that brings us to the clinical relevance. You know, I'm a clinician, and whenever I look at neuroplasticity, I ask myself, can I use this in the clinic to help individual children with hearing loss? And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Can we use these principles of neuroplasticity in individual decision-making? So this P1 is very replicable. I showed you how to get it. You can get it with an implant. You can get it with a hearing aid. And looking at thousands of children, we have now described these different responses, these patterns of responses. So this is a typically developing cortex. If I see this large negativity, I know it's an unstimulated cortex. It hasn't received auditory stimulation. This is a partially stimulated cortex, and this is a reorganized cortex where it's, you know, the outcomes will not be good. And this is how we use it. So this is a child who is deaf, who's uh, fitted with a hearing aid. And here you can see a large negativity, which shows it's an unstimulated cortex. And the P1 response is outside of normal limits. And then you can see five months later, it's within the, the shape of the waveform changes. And it's within normal limits, and it's progressing normally. Contrast it with this child. 10 months of wearing a hearing aid, we still see this large negativity showing that the hearing aid has provided no stimulation to the cortex. Child gets a cochlear implant. One month after an implant, you can see how the wave shape changes. And then it continues to change and within normal limits at six months proceeding normally. So we can use neuroplasticity to guide decisions about early intervention in individual children. We write a clinical report for every single child. We send it to the parents and to the doctors in charge, and we include a graph that shows at a glance the cortical maturational status of that particular child. So here you can see the child was outside, moving to normal limits. Okay, we've found this really helpful in children with multiple disabilities. So the truth is that cochlear implants are such a highly successful biomedical intervention that 40% of children who are getting cochlear implants have comorbid multiple disabilities. And unfortunately, nearly half of these children were implanted after the sensitive period. Because I don't need to tell the clinicians in this group that it's very difficult to get behavioral responses in children with multiple disabilities. And so we really want to explore the use of objective measures like um, cortical plasticity to see if we can help these children. So I'll just present two cases. Here's a child with CHARGE syndrome. And uh, this child was fitted with a, uh, hearing aids at five months of age, and the clinician was very unsure of the behavioral responses, and they sent them to our lab. And you can see this is the aided audiogram, but again, she was very unsure. And then you can see what a beautiful P1 response we got, very clear, and it's within normal limits. So it shows that the hearing aid is providing enough information for the cortex to develop in this child. Then there was this child with something called Pallister Killian syndrome. I had never even heard of this syndrome. I had to read up about it. And it is a very severe syndrome with hydrocephalus. And so the child was very, very seriously impaired. And they didn't know whether to implant or not to implant. And again, the clinician was very unsure of the behavioral responses. But we got a very clear P1 many times. And it was always outside of normal limits. And then the clinicians, the surgeon went ahead and implanted, and we are monitoring this child. So again, you can use neuroplasticity to help you with decision making, not just in children with multiple disabilities, but again, we have found it very useful in children with ANSD. And here's a child who was fit with hearing aids at six months of age. 
and you can see very clearly the unaided response and the aided response and it goes from being outside of normal limits to within normal limits and the child is doing quite well on behavioral um, um, behavioral functioning has about 39 out of 40 on the it maze. Contrast that with this child who uh, was fitted uh, who was fitted with hearing aids very early at three um, three months of age and had absolutely no response with hearing aids. They gave the child a cochlear implant and you can see the response comes out very nicely with the cochlear implant. It moves from no response to within normal limits and this child is doing quite well. So we find that you can use cortical potentials and neuroplasticity in individual children to guide decisions, um, especially in cases of multiple disabilities and ANSD. Okay, I'd like to talk briefly about another form of neuroplasticity that we're looking in the lab. So that was neuroplasticity in the auditory cortex. This is cross-modal neuroplasticity, which is, for example, in deafness, other kinds of modalities like vision and somatosensation can take over areas of auditory cortex. Andre Kral and Steve Lomba have shown this in animals and congenitally deaf cats, and Pascal Sandman sitting there has some beautiful papers in uh, congenitally deaf implanted adults showing cross-modal plasticity from vision. We are looking at it in cochlear implanted children, and yes, all our children are this cute and this happy <laughs> when we take the pictures. Anyway, we present a visual motion stimulus, and we do some high-density EEG, and here you can see normal hearing children, cochlear implanted children, and in normal hearing children, for visual stimulation, we see activation of occipital visual areas. In cochlear implanted children, you can see additional activation of temporal cortex, of auditory areas in response to vision. And, he, oh, sorry, this got uh, uh, cut out, but this is the correlation between speech and noise and the amount of cross-modal plasticity in children with cochlear implants, and there is a moderate correlation. So the more the cross-modal plasticity, the worse the performance with implants. And it's not just vision, but tactile somatosensory uh, modality also uh, recruits auditory areas. So when we present vibrotactile stimulation, uh, very clear data in normal hearing children, we see activation of postcentral gyrus somatosensory cortex in children with cochlear implants, we see additional activation of auditory cortex. So again, this kind of neuroplasticity, you know, a lot of people in implants are doing it, but what we want to know is can we use it to guide decision-making in individual children? And so that's what we want to look at. So let me show you some individual data. This is a normal hearing child. When we present visual stimuli, we see activation of occipital areas. This is a good user with a cochlear implant, gets 96% on speech perception, and it's very similar to normal. But look at this. This is a child who is not doing very well with the cochlear implant, only gets 67%, and you can see additional activation of auditory cortical areas. Similarly, with somatosensory corte uh, stimulation, a good user with the implant, 94% on speech perception, shows very similar activation to normal of postcentral gyrus, somatosensory cortex. But when you have an average user with the cochlear implant only getting 76% on speech perception, you can see additional activation of auditory cortical areas. So it's possible, and I'm only speculating here because this is in early stages, that you could take this information to decide on rehabilitation methodologies for these children. So for example, if a child is showing no reorganization by other modalities, then maybe they will do very well with auditory oral kinds of rehabilitation. But if a child is already reorganized by vision or by touch, then maybe sign language or some combination methods are better for this brain. So what we're saying is it's, it's useful to bring in neuroplasticity into everyday decision making for rehabilitation for children with implants and deafness in general. Okay, and I want to end with a last case study where we looked, where we 
show the example of looking at auditory plasticity and higher order plasticity to look at intervention. So single-sided deafness is a controversial topic in the United States because it's the, it, the implants for it is not FDA approved. I know in Germany it is, so it's probably much more advanced here. This is a nine-year-old child who was deaf since birth and then had a progressive severe loss. So here we can already see the difference in the two ears, normal hearing ear for a nine-year-old child. We see this P1, but we see this additional N1, P2 response coming from secondary cortex, okay? In the deaf ear, in the single-sided deaf ear, you, you only see the P1. It's a delayed response. When we look at activation, for the normal side, we see contralateral activation as expected, okay? And for the deaf side, very similar to Andre's cats, we see ipsilateral activation, okay? So it's showing some abnormalities in the auditory system. So now the child gets an implant and we want to track the neuroplasticity in this child. And so before implant, you can see in the deaf ear, there was a P1. Three months after implant, it looks very similar Eight months after implant, you can see the response changes and there is a P1, N1, and P2. So very clear development is taking place. And about 14 months later, it is almost identical to the other side. And remember I showed you in the deaf ear, it was mainly ipsilateral activation with some frontal activation uh, suggesting cognitive load. And after that, when the response changes to a P1, N1, P2, we see mainly contralateral activation. In terms of higher order plasticity, visual cord, so the, this, before implantation, the child had uh, recruitment from visual cortex and from somatosensory cortex. And after implantation, the visual was partially reversed and the somatosensory reorganization was completely reversed. And so in individual children, the point I'm making is that you can use neuroplasticity to track what's going on and make better decisions. That child is actually a very good user. Michael Dorman tested her and on spatial and binaural things, she has almost adult-like behavior. So I would like to end by saying that in our lab, we find cortical neuroplasticity useful in determining intervention and rehabilitative options for individual children with hearing loss. And uh, we find cortical evoke potentials are easy to measure and a useful biomarker for tracking this neuroplasticity. Please email me if you have questions, and I invite you all to come visit the lab in Boulder, Colorado, and thank you for your attention.